How to Care for Others, part two. Because sometimes part one is just not enough. So, how to care for others. Let's begin with prayer. Father, I thank you so very much for your precious holy word. I thank you for faithful people who have given their lives to give us a Bible in the language that we can understand. I thank you, Father, for godly men and women who have studied and read and shared your word throughout the centuries of the church. And so, Father, as we gather here this morning, we do so in recognition that we are not inventing something new. We are seeking simply to be faithful to your word. And to that end, I ask, Lord, that you would set me aside and that you, through your Holy Spirit, would communicate the truth of your word to your people. And I ask, Father, that we would leave here transformed. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We mentioned this last week, but I want to stress it again today, and that is that the foundation of caring for others is a desire to help them. We cannot care for others if we don't want to, right? And there are several times in the gospel accounts where Jesus is moved with compassion for people. And one of those gospel accounts is actually one of my favorite miracles of Jesus. So turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. And we put some of our pew Bibles back. I didn't get all of them put back. So if you have a pew Bible, this is page 1152. Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, verse 40. Mark chapter 1, verse 40. We're going to look at 40 to 42. Mark chapter 1, verse 40. Now a leper came to him, him meaning Jesus, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus, moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. From what we have read, why did Jesus heal the leper? Okay, yeah, compassion. He loved him. He was moved with compassion. This is one of those times where if we did a literal rendering in English, it would sound weird to us because it talks about him being moved in his bowels. And that was the way that in that time they uh, expressed this idea that someone is overwhelmed with compassion for someone else. So Jesus heals this man because he moved with compassion for him. Why did Jesus touch him? Now, this is fascinating because if you notice in the passage, this man isn't healed until Jesus speaks. It says, when he had spoken, the man is healed. Je did Jesus need to touch this man in order to heal him? No. Why did he touch the leper? Because it had probably been years since this man had been touched. Lepers were outcasts. He's moved with compassion to heal this man, and the expression of his love is him reaching out and touching this leper. The touch was a physical manifestation of Christ's love. Jesus wanted to help him. Jesus cared. He had a heart and attitude of compassion, and as we noted last week, this is the main idea of what Paul presents to us in 1 Corinthians. In our passage, Paul teaches about three main attitudes that we need to have in order to care for others. And so the principle here is not in the PowerPoint slide. The principle is, uh, on, I think, on your notes, but it might not even be there. 
Listen carefully. Here's the principle. Caring for others is a gospel priority. Caring for others is a gospel priority. That principle comes with some guidance. How do we do that? To properly care for others, our attitude must be right. So caring for others is a gospel priority. To care for others, we have to have the right attitude, and then it's going to lead us to an outcome. When we care for others, the gospel is advanced, and Christ is glorified. When we care for others, the gospel is advanced, and Christ is glorified. Three main attitudes that we need to have if we're going to care for others. We looked at one and a half of them last week. We're going to look at the second one and a half today, but first we're going to review. We talked last week about if we're going to care for others, we need to seek their good. We need to seek their good. This demands discernment, we noted, in verse 23. This demands determination in verse 24. So we're going to seek their good through discernment and determination. Secondly, we're going to guard their conscience. We're going to guard their conscience. One of the ways we protect and care for one another is to guard our consciences. And there's two ways that we do that. We saw last week that we ask necessary questions in verses 25 to 27. And we noted that you don't want to create drama where there is none, right? We said you don't ask, Paul said don't ask questions about where the food came from. Just eat it, right? Just eat it. So we're going to care for others by guarding their conscience, and we do that by asking necessary questions. Secondly, and this is where we are this morning, we're going to avoid doubtful decisions. We're going to avoid doubtful decisions. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 28. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 28. But if anyone says to you, This was offered to idols. Do not eat it for the sake of the one who told you and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. So here's the scenario. You're sitting down. Someone has invited you over to their house to eat. You are eating. And Paul says, if they don't tell you where the food comes from, don't ask. Now he says, if they tell you where it came from, he says, don't eat it. So what we learn from this verse is that there is always someone out there who wants to ruin a good meal. Just, just kidding. In all seriousness, <laughs> you need to, we need to keep this scenario in mind, right? You're eating at someone's house. They are an unbeliever. Chances are, if they say to you where they got the meat, there's something behind the statement. Does that make sense? Because I have never gone to somebody's house and had them tell me what store they bought the food at or what brand it is. Any of you had that experience? No. So if you're eating at this person's house, Paul says, and they feel like they need to tell you where it's from, there's a reason why they're telling you, okay? This is a test. Paul says there's only one way to pass. Don't eat. Thomas Constable puts it this way in his commentary. He says, We might think that in such a situation, Paul would have advocated exercising Christian liberty to eat the meat, but he did not. He advocated abstaining not because such meat was out of bounds for believers. It was not out of bounds. Christians could eat such meat. He advocated abstaining for the sake of the pagan's moral conscience. Specifically, If the Christian ate the meat, the pagan might conclude that his guest was doing something Christians should not do. He would be wrong, of course. Yet, Paul advocated not violating the pagan's understanding of what Christians should or should not do, rather than instructing him about Christian freedom at the table. See, if you're in Paul's day and age, and this is a big issue, eating this meat, and this guy says to you, hey, by the way, this was offered to idols, you have a choice. You can say, yeah, but I'm a believer in Jesus. I can eat whatever I want. And you may have just missed a gospel opportunity. Paul says it is far better not to eat the meat so that you have an open door from which to proclaim Christ than it is to enjoy a good steak. This is huge. We'll put it this way. The perception of an unbeliever is more important than my freedom in Christ. Now, this is such a foreign idea to so many today because there's this mindset of, I have freedom to do whatever I want. It's all about me. 
Paul says, nope, Ah, wrong answer. It is not about you. (laughs) Exactly. Thank you. Okay, everyone, if like the youngest, the second youngest here gets it, we better all walk out here with that same understanding, okay? Thank you. That was perfect. I could not, I didn't plan that, by the way. Paul again says here, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. We can eat whatever we want. However, freedom is not the issue. Look at verse 29. Chapter 10, verse 29. Conscience, I say, not your own, but that of the other. For why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? Paul says, this isn't about your freedom. This is about the conscience of someone who does not know Christ. Even though we have the freedom to eat whatever we want, we limit that freedom for gospel opportunity. Paul has given direction. We eat whatever we are given, asking no questions. However, if information is volunteered, we assume that there is a belief that we shouldn't be eating what we have been given. And so based on that assumption, we don't eat, that we might have a gospel opportunity. Now, if you were to read commentaries on this passage or you were to listen to others, you're going to find that there is some disagreement on who Paul is addressing here as whose conscience we need to protect. Okay. Some argue that the, he is talking about a weaker brother or sister, and that is a, is a possible interpretation of this. Personally, I think he's talking about the person whose house you're at, the unbeliever. But he could be talking about a weaker brother or sister. If that's the case, then the scenario would be you're eating at somebody's house, and you have a brother or sister in Christ with you there, and they bring out the meat, and your brother and sister in Christ leans over to you and says, Hey, this was offered to idols. What's your response? Same. You don't eat. (laughs) Either way, whether you're dealing with an unbeliever or a believer, you don't eat the meat because you're guarding the conscience of the person who told you. That's Paul's point. Okay? So then Paul asks a question that we have to address. Why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? He follows it up with another question in verse 30. We're going to deal with both of them together. So look at verse 30. He says, but if I partake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of for the food over which I give thanks? It must be remembered that Paul's whole point in this section is that sometimes it is necessary to voluntarily limit our freedom for the good of others. In chapter 8, Paul argued that we may sometimes need to limit our freedom to protect the conscience of a weaker brother or sister. He's, all of that is wrapped up into what the argument that he's making here. The point here, I believe, is that we could hinder the gospel in this situation. And that is what we want to avoid, okay? We limit our freedom in Christ if it could hinder the gospel. That's what Paul did in chapter 9. By the way, chapter 9 was all about Paul explaining to them why he refused to be paid by the Corinthians, because it was about the gospel, right? In the same way, Paul's saying that in a particular situation, it may be advantageous to the gospel to limit our exercise of freedom. I can put it into perspective like this. Is it more important to eat a good steak or to have the chance to share Christ with your host? Hopefully that's clear to all of us, right? Oh, I don't know. How good is the steak, Pastor? That's, that's what I need to know, right? I mean, are we talking Omaha Steak Company? Or, you know, what are we talking about here? That's not Paul's point. Paul's point is, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if it's the best steak you will ever have in your life. If it could limit the gospel or harm the conscience of a weaker brother or sister, you chuck the meat. Don't do it. Don't do it. Thomas Constable, again, puts it clearly in his commentary. He says, we do not need to alter our convictions for the sake of others, even though they speak evil of us, as the Corinthians did of Paul. Nevertheless, we should be willing to change our behavior for the sake of unbelievers. This is a very important distinction. He is not telling us, Paul is not telling us to change our convictions. He's not saying because there's a weaker brother or sister or because this unbeliever thinks you shouldn't do it, you need to change your opinion on the matter. What he's saying is in that particular situation, in that context, don't do it. Limit your freedom for the sake 
of the gospel. Paul made it clear in 1 Timothy 4, 3 through 5, that we can eat whatever we want. He said, he's quoting, uh, talking about false teachers. He says, they for, are forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So this is one of those times where we have to say, Paul, it seems like you're contradicting yourself. Because over here you say you can eat whatever you want as long as you're giving thanks for it. And here you tell us to, to not eat it. Well, which is it? Paul says that depends. That depends on the situation. If you're in a situation where eating something would hinder the gospel or offend the conscience of someone, don't do it. But if you're not in that situation, if I'm in my own home, I can eat or drink whatever I want. That's what Paul says. Okay? We're not dealing with a sin issue. We're dealing with a conscience issue coupled with the responsibility to share the gospel. Sometimes our only consideration is the conscience of others. And Paul's point in verse 30 is that sometimes we're going to be misunderstood and sometimes our exercise of liberty is going to be spoken of as evil and sometimes that could put up a barrier to the gospel. And so Paul's argument is this. It is far better to deny ourselves something than it is to hinder the gospel. Because why are we here? Let's be honest. It's to have really good steaks. No, sorry. It's to share the gospel, not to have really good steaks or whatever else it might be. Maybe you are one of those crazy people who like seafood. I say crazy. I don't like seafood. Maybe you like sushi. My wife likes sushi. That's insane, but you know if you like it. The thing is, food and drink is not more important than people. Okay? We care for others. To care for them, we guard their conscience by avoiding doubtful decisions. If something could hinder the gospel, if it could offend a weaker brother or sister in Christ, we avoid it. It's not worth it. It's Noah. So the lesson is this. Don't hinder the gospel for personal enjoyment. Read that with me. Don't hinder the gospel for personal enjoyment. Our purpose here is far more important than our pleasure. And that's exactly where Paul is going next. So as we've seen, there's three main attitudes that we need to have if we're going to care for others. First, we seek their good. Secondly, we guard their conscience. Now, thirdly, we desire their salvation. Desire their salvation. Paul has already said it in this epistle, this letter to the Corinthian church. Everything he does is about the gospel. In 117, he said God, Christ sent him to preach the gospel. In chapter 9, he says he endures all things for the sake of the gospel. And then he says, woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. He says, I've become all things to all people that I might by all means win some. Save some. This is the driving force in his life. It's not about his freedom. Paul lived for the freedom of of others. What does it look like to live for the salvation of others? Four ideas in these last four verses. Number one, live for the glory of God. Live for the glory of God. <clears throat> Verse 31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Wouldn't it have been great if Paul just said, if you eat or drink, okay, whew, let's me off the hook. Don't have to do my work to the glory of God. Ah, oh, man, but he put in whatever you do. Whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. Paul starts, starts this verse with the word therefore. He says, considering everything that I have just presented, what has he presented? What happened to Israel when they got cut up, caught up in corrupt desires, corrupt worship, corrupt sexuality, corrupt faith? The result was their corruption, of their corruption was separation from God. If we prioritize our freedom over the salvation and growth of others, we too are guilty of corruption. What is Paul's solution? Do all to the glory of God. How do you avoid offending a weaker brother and sister? How do you avoid putting up a barrier to the gospel? Do all to the glory of God. 
Now look at the list that Paul gives us. Are you eating food? Eat to the glory of God. Are you drinking a beverage? Drink to the glory of God. Are you doing something else? Do it to the glory of God. Leon Morris writes this. He says, the principle is clear. The Christian is not concerned with his rights, but with the glory of God. Eating, drinking, everything must be subordinated to this. Everything done by the child of God must be done for the glory of God. Would you read that with me? Everything done by the child of God must be done for the glory of God. Any activity that cannot be done for the glory of God must not be done at all. Let me say that again. Any activity that cannot be done for the glory of God must not be done at all. Paul's point here is that I may be free to eat meat in some context and not in others. What determines my actions is the glory of God. What we have to ask is this. In this circumstance, in this situation, can I do this? Can I engage in this activity and still bring glory to God in it? That's the question. And so the lesson is this. The purpose of the Christian life is the glory of God. Read that with me, please. The purpose of the Christian life is the glory of God. This means we have a test. The test is the glory test. If it doesn't bring glory to God, it does not belong in our lives. If it doesn't bring glory to God, it doesn't belong in our lives. That's the test. Does this bring glory to God? Nope, chuck it. Get rid of it. Now, Sometimes we, think, we have this tendency to think, well, then that means I can never have any leisure activities. I can never uh, have a hobby. That's not what we're saying. You can have a hobby and still glorify God. Jesus took time to rest. There's this shirt I've seen several times, and I love it. It says, Jesus took naps. Be like Jesus, right? Jesus took naps. Jesus got away to pray. Jesus took time to rest. Okay? So we're not saying you have to always be you know, nose to the grindstone every second of every day. No. What we're saying is, in your leisure activity, is it something that Scripture says don't do? Then don't do it. Right? If doing said activity would bring a barrier to the gospel or offend the weaker conscience of someone, don't do it. And the final three verses that we'll look at Paul makes it clear that what, what does and does not bring glory to God. So these four ideas, if we're going to live for the salvation of others, number one, live for the glory of God. Number two, live without offense. Live without offense. Verse 32, give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. Paul lists for us here three classifications of humanity. He says, Jews, Gentiles, Church of God. According to Galatians 3.28, we're all one in Christ. Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. He's not saying when you come to Christ, you quit being a Jew or you quit being a Gentile or you quit being a man or a woman. Okay? What he's saying is we're one in Christ. So what he's, the, the point here is that if the Jews and Gentiles would be people who are not believers, okay? And he says, so if you're a Jew and you're not a believer, or you're a Gentile and not a believer, or if you're a believer, you're part of the church, don't offend any of them. So who does he cover by saying this? Everyone. Okay? Now, elsewhere he says, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all people. Okay? So we're going to do all we can not to offend other people. What he's not telling us to do is compromise the gospel, okay? Because the gospel is offensive, right? So he's not talking about that kind of offense. He's saying the gospel is going to offend, but don't be offensive, right? As you're offending people with the gospel, don't be offensive. I, it's a little, yeah. What he's saying is this. We live without offense to all people, even those who are already believers, so that others will come to Christ. This is really interesting to me. <clears throat> here's, here's kind of the point of Paul's argument. How you and I treat one another in the body of Christ can hinder someone coming to Christ. 
Have you ever ran into somebody who says, well, I would be a Christian, but I've seen how they treat one another, so I don't want anything to do with that. That's what he's saying. He says, don't offend anyone in the church or outside of the church. Okay? Give no offense. In the body of Christ, we need to be careful how we treat one another. Love needs to be our motivation, never selfishness. And that's what Paul's getting at. <clears throat> I want to give you kind of an example just from our, our body here. You have, I'm sure, noticed that we have quite a few kids around the church now. And their smiling faces and their running feet are such a blessing, right? They have more energy. They run, they talk, they play, and that has unique challenges, doesn't it? See, my job as a parent is to teach my kids how to be careful as they are moving around, right? How to, uh, when to talk and when not to, right? That's my job as a parent, okay? And that's a process. That's a process. However, you have a responsibility too as people in the church. And that is, kids will be kids. Don't be upset with kids for being kids, right? Be understanding. Be gracious. We meet in the middle. What am I saying? What I'm saying is this. When all of us strive not to offend one another, the body of Christ is strengthened and encouraged. Do we, do we understand that God can use children for his glory? He just did earlier in the service with Charlotte. That was perfect. Right? That was wonderful. That was, that was, I think that was a God thing. Okay? So we have to be gracious towards one another because I can't be a parent who says, well, I know my kid knocked you down in the hallway, but eh, should have been looking where you were going, huh? Right? I'm not going to do that. But hopefully all of us are understanding that if a kid's running down the hallway, yeah, we're going to address that, but it's a kid. We have to meet in the middle, right? We're working with one another. Paul says, give no offense. That goes both ways. All of us have to strive not to give offense to one another. There's going to be times where I'm going to say things and you're going to go, I didn't like that very much. Please come tell me, right? Because I may have misspoken. I may have said something wrong. I may have something that I need to apologize for, right? And I promise to do the same to you, okay? We are, we're a body. We're, we're working together. And so that's Paul's heart here. He says, don't offend people. Be kind, be gracious. Why? Because it's a gospel thing. If people see us in the body of Christ harping on each other all the time, they're not going to be attracted to that. But if, if they see us loving one another, that is attractive to people. He says, give no offense. This word offense is the Greek word aproskopos, and it means blameless, clear, not causing stumbling not promoting a person sinning by one's actions or lifestyle. Is this how we want to live? We have freedom in Christ. Are we abusing that freedom? We desire people who do not know Christ to come to him, and so it matters how we treat each other. It matters how we treat those who are outside the faith. Do not, here's the lesson, do not put up barriers. There it is, barriers to the gospel. Read that with me, please. Do not put up barriers to the gospel. He says, live without offense. If we're going to see people saved, this, this is pretty logical, okay? If we're going to see people saved, don't offend them, okay? There we go. However, we must also avoid offending each other, right? How we treat one another in the body of Christ is a gospel issue. How we treat one another in the body of Christ is a gospel issue, and we need to be careful with that. So four ideas to live for the salvation of others. Number one, live for the glory of God. Number two, live without offense. Number three, live for the gospel. Live for the gospel. Paul says here in verse 33, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. So he says, don't give offense. And now he gives us the opposite, right? Please, people. Please could also be translated, win the favor of. Paul says, my goal is to win the favor of people. Why? Because I want them to get saved. <laughs> That's his goal. He says, I'm, not, I'm seeking their profit, their benefit or advantage. We don't live for our own benefit. We're not here to gain all the advantage for ourselves. It's not about my profit or yours. It's about salvation. 
Because the greatest benefit that anyone can have is salvation from the penalty power and presence of sin. Salvation has a past, present, and a future effect in our lives. We are saved from the penalty of sin, right? That's past. And when we trust in Christ, it's already happened. We're being saved presently from the power of sin. This is sanctification, right? We're being saved from the presence of or the power of sin. And then one day, we're going to be saved from the very presence of sin, right? That's when we stand before Christ. That's future. So we have been saved from the power of sin. We're being, sorry, from the penalty of sin. We're being saved from the power of sin. We will be saved from the presence of sin. This is the gospel that we live for. Our desire is to see everyone enjoying this benefit. That is Paul's focus. This is what motivates him. He says, I deny myself, not just because I, I like to uh, suffer, right? I don't want to eat good food. That's why I deny myself. No, Paul denies himself because he wants to see people saved. And he says, I want to seek their benefit. I want to have this pleasing of them, right? He says, I please all men in all things. Whew, Paul, that is a big statement. And he doesn't say, I please all men in all things because I just like it. He says he does it so they will be saved. He's winning their favor. That's the idea of this pleasing them. He's winning their favor. Why? To open the door for the gospel. This is part of our purpose in living for the glory of God. This is part of our purpose in giving no offense. We want to break down every possible barrier to the gospel. Again, this doesn't mean we compromise. It means that the salvation of others is more important than getting to do whatever I want. Focus on others. Don't seek your own benefit. Seek the benefit of others. Keep your eyes on the goal. What's the goal? The salvation of the lost. The best way that we can care for others is to desire their salvation. And we do this by living for the gospel. And so here's our lesson. Desire the salvation of the lost. Would you read that with me? Desire the salvation of the lost. This is the whole point of living for the gospel. We want to see people come to Christ. We want people to be saved. Our goal has to be to get ourselves out of the way. That's what Paul's saying. He's saying, I'm, I'm trying to get out of the way so that the Holy Spirit can do his work in people's lives. Four ideas to live for the gospel. Number one, live for the glory of God. Number two, live without offense. Number three, live for the gospel. Number four, live as a copy of Christ. Live as a copy of Christ. Chapter 11, verse one, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. There's two elements to this verse, two levels of imitation. First, a definition. He says, imitate me. And this is an interesting word because there's two Greek words that are combined to form this translation of the word imitate. The word imitate literally is uh, this Greek word mimitis, and it means a person who copies the words or behavior of another. But there's another word here that uh, is not translated, oops, and you see it there, secondly, genomai, and it means to be or become, to take place, to become, enter a certain state or condition. So what Paul is saying is become an imitator of me, right? Change your, in a sense, your state of being to be an imitator. Become an imitator of me as I am an imitator of Christ. These two words form an imperative command. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. The Corinthians we have seen have not been following good examples. And Paul wants them to do something different. He says, become an imitator of me. What this tells us is this. Who we follow matters. Who we follow matters. We have to ask, are, there, are the teachers we listen to pursuing Christ? Are they growing and maturing in their walk with him? Do we follow people who are willing to set aside their personal freedom for the sake of the gospel? So this is the first level. The men that we follow, the teachers that we follow, the people that we follow, are they imitating Christ? Because that is the second level. Imitate Christ. What is the example of Christ? In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, Paul says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Christ became poor for us. 
Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Christ became a servant. Christ humbled himself. So if we are going to copy Christ, imitate Christ, here's the lesson. Christ limited his freedom for the sake of others. Can we do less than our Savior? Be imitators of Christ. What's the standard? Christ. So we're not done until we've reached the standard. So I'll just ask, anyone here attained Christ-like perfection yet? Good, okay, all right. Since we're not there yet, we pursue Christ together. We pursue the character of Christ until he calls us home. This is how we care for others. We seek their good before our own. We guard their conscience, even when that means the limitation of personal freedom. We do all of this because we desire people to come to salvation in Jesus Christ. Our desire for the salvation of others leads us to live in a certain way. How is it that we live? We live for the glory of God. Every single activity we engage in must pass the glory test. We seek to live without offense. We want people to be saved. We can't do that if we're offending them. We cannot see people saved if we're too busy fighting one another. We live for the benefit of others that they might be saved. Keep the gospel door open. We imitate Christ. Christ gave up everything to come and die for us. We should be willing to lay aside our personal freedom to see people saved. On a personal level, my life is to bring glory to God intentionally. So Paul says even the most mundane of activities, eating and drinking, should be done with the glory of God in view. If I can't say something or think something and bring glory to God, then I should stay away from it. And so maybe a commitment with this would be each day determined to bring God glory. In our relationships, Paul says, give no offense. Seek the benefit of others. Those are God's guidelines for our relationships, our friendships. We need to be seeking to do one of two things in our friendships. We, with believers, we seek to build them up. With unbelievers, we seek gospel opportunities. And so maybe a commitment here would be actively seek the well-being of those we interact with. In our parenting, you know what I want to be able to say? I want to be able to say with Paul, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And the question we need to ask ourselves every single day is this, would I want my children to imitate my behavior today? How can we be worthy of imitation? We do what Paul described. We live for the benefit of others. We live with a clear conscience. We live for the glory of God. We give no offense. We seek for others to know Christ. We live in constant imitation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so the commitment here would be to be an example worthy to follow. In our marriages, where should the behavior of Paul, this behavior that he has described, where should it begin? With those closest to us. Is my behavior toward my spouse bringing glory to God? And we say, well, yeah, I'm behaving good. What about your attitude? (laughs) What about my attitude toward my spouse? Am I bringing offense to my spouse? Paul says, live without offense. That goes for your spouse too. Am I seeking their benefit, their profit? Am I seeking to imitate Christ in my marriage? Marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. We need to live to make that picture crystal clear. And sometimes we say, well, I will when they do. Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't say that? I'll save them when they earn it. Mm -mm. So maybe a commitment here would be love your spouse for the glory of God. I'm going to give you just a moment to write down a commitment, and then we will... Wrap it up. To care for others, we must first care about them. A heart of compassion is produced by the Holy Spirit, so we must live in submission to Him. To care for others, we seek their good. 
We guard their conscience. We desire their salvation. The key to all of this is living for the glory of God. One who lives for the glory of God is an imitator of Jesus Christ. But we cannot imitate Christ if we do not know him. This has to do with salvation. Have you trusted in Jesus? Have you placed your faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross? He died for you. He rose again. He's alive today. Trust in him. We cannot imitate Christ if we do not know him, but we also cannot imitate Christ if we do not learn of him through his word. This has to do with our sanctification. I can't imitate Christ if I don't know what he was like, if I don't know what he said, if I don't know what he did. And so finally, care for others to see them saved and to see them grow. Care for others to see them saved and to see them grow. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word. Lord, your word does not leave us comfortable. (laughs) When it tells us to live without offense, when it tells us to do all of these things, these are not easy. These are not things that we can do apart from your Holy Spirit. Father, I just ask that today, everything we do, everything we say, and everything we think, would bring praise and honor and glory to you and to your name. We pray all of these things in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen.